this video, we will go over cell membranes. So we're finally starting to do cellular biology, right? This isn't some review over DNA or RNA. So let's just get right into it. So the cell membrane, it, it consists of lipids and proteins. So the cell membrane is made of lipids and also proteins. And of course, a lipid is a fat. So that is a fat, right? And these lipids and proteins, they're arranged in two sheets. So we have one sheet of lipids and then we have another sheet of lipids. And so together they make like a sandwich and the sandwich is called the lipid bilayer. So this is the lipid bilayer. So lipid again is fat, bi means two and there are layers. So that means two layers of fat. That is one layer, which are the, the redheads. And there's another uh, layer, which is the other redheads. Now between these sandwiches of lipids are proteins. So these protein molecules, they can act as channels and let things in, or they can allow the, the surface of a cell to stick to other cells. And so they do a, a bunch of different things. And we're going to go over what those proteins do in a little bit. But just remember that the cell membrane right here, so this is like the cell and this is the cell membrane, that is made of lipids. So the cell membrane is made of fats and it has proteins in it. And so what kind of fat makes the cell membrane? The lipid that makes the cell membrane, they are called phospholipids. So this is a phospho, phospholipid. And what a phospholipid is, is essentially two, um, two fatty acids connected to a glycerol. So this right here, one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, that is called a glycerol. So glycerol. So this glycerol backbone is connected to two fatty acids. So we have two fatty acids, right? And they're, connect they're connected in positions one and two for this example. And then on the third position or the unoccupied carbon, you will have a phosphate group. So this is a phosphate, phosphate group. And sometimes you call that the phosphate head because it's kind of like the head of the molecule. And because we have two fatty acids, sometimes phospholipids are called diglycerides. So we have diglycerides. Okay, so they're pretty cool. And you're probably wondering why is there a red X? Well, sometimes this red X is a hydrogen. So if you have a hydrogen on this oxygen, then this becomes a phosphatic acid. So that would be a phosphatidic, sorry, phosphatidic acid. And it doesn't really happen that much. It's kind of, it's not rare. It just doesn't happen as much as you would think it would. So it's just a small occurrence. Now, if this X was a small polar molecule, so if I was a small polar molecule, then it could be anything, right? It could be like, a, for instance, it could be choline, it could be serene, etc. What I'm saying is, sometimes a small polar molecule will actually attach itself to the phosphate head, and that will make a different molecule. So depending on what attaches to this position, you'll have a different uh, phospholipid, and that could do different properties for the cell. And so on the exam, if you're asked, what is the main component of the cell membrane? What, what type of lipid would it be? You would say, well, it would be a phospholipid. So we would have a lot of phospholipids, or the answer choice could be a, di um, a diglyceride. So diglyceride or phospholipids, those are the same things. Those are the same answers. So they would be the correct answer for that exam. So here we have three different pictures of the same phospholipid as before. So in position X, this would be another position X, we have choline. And remember that choline is a small polar molecule. And notice how it attached itself to one of the oxygens in the phosphate head. 
So depending on the addition of a polar molecule, you would have different properties. So this is still a phospholipid. And we know that because we have two fatty acids uh, connected to the, um, to the glycerol backbone. But notice that we can have two configurations. We can have a straight configuration, and then we can, we can have kind of like a crooked transformation. So what does that mean? So this straight conformation, that is called the cis conformation, and the crooked conformation is called the trans conformation. Usually, the cis and the trans, they can affect the fluidity of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane, if you'd like to think about it, is kind of like oil. So e either it can be very fluid, or it can be very rigid, and, and it, it won't be able to move or to contract very easily. And so what dictates the fluidity of the cell membrane is actually double bonds. So either we are saturated or unsaturated. If you haven't taken biochemistry, that's fine. I'll actually explain a little bit of fats in this slide. So let's just get into it. If we say that we are saturated, that means that all the carbons in this fatty acid have hydrogens, okay? So each carbon would have two hydrogens, right? Because we have this carbon connected with this carbon and et cetera, right? So each carbon has four bonds. That means that each carbon needs two hydrogens. And that means that we are saturated. But if we are unsaturated, that means that we have a double bond. And that means that we do not have the maximum amount of hydrogens possible. So notice that this carbon has three bonds. That means I need one more bond for four. And that means I only have one hydrogen. So notice which molecule has more hydrogens connected to carbons. It would be this guy. So this guy is saturated. This guy right there does not have the maximum amount of hydrogens, so he is unsaturated. Now, unsaturated um, fats, I would say, they are actually, um, they're more fluid. So this one is more fluid. And the reason why is because whenever they are stacked together, they cannot be close to each other. So these phospholipids, they have this little little creek in their legs, and that kind of separates them apart, right? It pulls them apart. And therefore, we can wiggle around. We can wiggle that way, we can wiggle this way, that way, right? But if we are packed together with saturated bonds, then I could put more phospholipids together, right? And if I have more phospholipids together, I can't really move. I'm really packed. I'm like a can of sardines. Or I'm like New Yorkers pretending that they like New York in a subway. Whenever you have New Yorkers in a subway, they're all packed and they're spreading germs and coughing off each other. and It's just bad. You know, you might see a rat pulling a, a slice of pepperoni cheese pizza, right? It's just not a good place to be in. And that's because they have saturated bonds. And because they're packed together, they can't... Uh, for lack of better words, they can't vibrate. Because really, molecules vibrate. And to be able to vibrate, you have to have enough room. But these guys, they don't have enough room to vibrate. And so the cell membrane would actually be very rigid, very firm. So again, to recap, if we have uh, unsaturated double bonds, then we can actually move around because we are further apart from each other. And therefore, the membrane would be fluid. Another way that you can uh, tell the difference is because um, if we had a long phospholipid, let's say 16 carbons, and then let's compare this to 14 carbons. Let's say that they are both saturated. So let's say that we have a fatty acid that is 16 carbons long, and we compare it to something that is 14 carbons long, and it's also saturated. Which one is more fluid? It would be the 14 carbon, because the less carbons you have, the more fluid you are. If you have more carbons, the more rigid you are. So let's clear everything. What if I wanted to compare a uh, four carbon long uh, fatty acid compared to a 24 carbon long fatty acid? And let's say that we have a double bond. So we have a double bond right there.
right? And right here we have carbons, carbons, etc. Which one is more fluid? It would be the four carbon molecule because it also has double bonds and it is also the shortest one. Okay, so short and unsaturated, that means that you are fluid. And that's really all you have to know about fats because that's always tested on exams. If you have this carbon, is it more fluid than this carbon? What's going to be the boiling point? What's going to be the melting point? Okay, we get it, you know, you should be good. And so these phospholipids, they're actually amphiphatic. So they are amphipathic. So what does amphipathic mean? It means that they are nonpolar and also polar. So they are polar and nonpolar. Why is that? Well, they have a polar head, so this region right there is polar, but then they have a nonpolar body, so this would be nonpolar. And when you combine these parts together, they make an amphipathic molecule, that being a phospholipid. And there are three main molecules that are amphipathic. There are more, but for this class, we'll really be uh, focusing on these three molecules. So of course you have your phospholipids, and then you're gonna have your sterols. So you have your sterols, you have your sterols, right? So let's write this better. And then you will have your glycolipids. Now, there's something you need to remember. And that sterols, they're really composed of hormones. So these are mainly your hormones. And if you're taking a medical, medical exam, you have to know that there are three, um, well, there are four rings, typically in hormones. Okay, so they're made of four rings. And three rings are going to be uh, cyclohexanes. Right, so we have three cyclohexanes, and we will have one cyclopentane. So if you're giving uh, a question that says, how many rings does a sterol, or how many rings does a hormone have, typically, you would say four, and that would be the correct answer. Okay, so for instance, this is a cholesterol. And we have sterol right there. And cholesterol, that's kind of like the foundation for other hormones. For instance, uh, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, those would be derived, those would be made from cholesterol. It's very important. And then we have some glycolipids. Glycolipids, they're mainly found in, again, the exterior part of the cell membrane. So you have the cell membrane right and then you would have these things sticking out of the cell membrane and those would be the glycolipids within the lipid bilayer we actually have a pretty stable interaction the reason why we form like a sandwich for these lipids is because the polar heads are going to be interacting with the water so the polar heads are going to be facing the external environment and the non-polar tails are going to be facing the internal environment right so this is the external environment so we can say external and these uh, these lipids right here the nonpolar part they're gonna be hiding they're gonna be tucked away inside the inner membrane right so this is kind of like the inner membrane of it so we have the inner inner uh, membrane And they do that because nonpolar molecules don't they don't want to interact with a polar substance. So again, water right there, it's pretty polar. And it doesn't want to interact with a nonpolar uh, environment. Okay? So to make the molecule more stable, we have a uh, adapted interaction. So again, the polar part of the phospholipids, they're gonna be facing the polar environment, and that being water and the nonpolar part is going to be uh, hidden, it's going to be hiding inside the center. So this is the nonpolar, and this is going to be polar. That's it. It just allows the molecule to be more stable. So if you were to put a drop of oil onto a cup of water, the oil would become like a circle.
right? It's not a rectangle or anything, it's a circle. And it does that because it doesn't want to have a lot of interactions with the water. And so here we can actually see some uh, some membranes being formed, right? So this is energy, um, well, it's actually energetically unfavorable. If you were just to have the phospholipids, which is the white part in this picture, if you were to have the phospholipids exposed to the water, that would uh, decrease the amount of energy in the system. So it's not energetically fav favorable. So um, you have to make like a sphere, right? And you know, I said you would decrease the energy like um, you would actually increase the energy so that was my mistake so if you have unpaired interactions within a polar substance and a nonpolar molecule that will actually raise the energy in the system and nature doesn't like raising energy it actually likes to decrease energy and so we make a sphere of these phospholipids to decrease the amount of interactions between the polar substance and the nonpolar substance and that will actually decrease the amount of energy in the system which is always favorable, right? So this would be a spontaneous reaction. So if you were looking at the delta G, which is Gibbs, this would be a spontaneous reaction, meaning it would have a negative free energy. So again, here's the water is interacting with the polar substance or the polar head of the phospholipids. And right here, we have the non-polar region. And that non-polar region is hidden away. It's not going to be interacting with the water. And again, we have like these circles that form whenever you drop oil into water, you form a circle. Sometimes you won't have a bilayer. Sometimes you'll have a monolayer. Monolayer. When does that happen? Well, it only happens if the internal substance is nonpolar. But when do we get that? We get that with drops of oil. So if we have like an oily substance, so let's say we have to transfer this uh, oily substance to a different part of the cell. Well, I mean, my tails are nonpolar. So my tails, they're not going to be upset if I'm interacting with a nonpolar substance. Those tails are going to be interacting with another oil. And oil mixed with an oil is nonpolar, so it's favorable. So I don't have to waste my energy making another phospho head, right? That doesn't make sense. And really we find these with triacylglycerols so we have triacylglycerols so we have triacylglycerols right and that's a g and really these are storage storage molecules storage lipids notice that we still have a glycerol backbone and we have two fatty acids connected in position one and two but we also have this other fatty acid and so really we have three fatty acids for triacylglycerol so we have three fatty acids okay so these are really good and these are purely purely hydrophobic these are hydrophobic and so this whole membrane is just created out of triacylglycerols so again these are going to have a glycerol backbone and they're gonna have a lot of um, fatty acids interacting with the substance inside so really that's it and what this is called this is called a lipid lipid body so this whole body is made of lipids and it stores fats so again it's a nonpolar molecule so it, it would be a monolayer right the cell membrane or specifically the lipid bilayer. So the lipid lipid bilayer, it's very impermeable. And what I mean by impermeable, that means that it doesn't allow things to enter it very easily, right? It blocks a lot of things. But what can enter the lipid bilayer? And we're assuming that we're not using any channels, we're not using any transporters, it's just a wall, okay? So what can enter this wall, right? What can enter is a small nonpolar molecule. So, for instance, gases like oxygen or carbon dioxide or even nitride, right? So, nitrogen. Those can enter the lipid bilayer pretty easily. And also, steroid hormones can enter the lipid bilayer easily. For instance, we can have a cell, right? And it has its little organelles and stuff. And it needs some testosterone, 
And so testosterone can enter the lipid bilayer, let's make this a triangle, it can go there and it can diffuse to the membrane and it can enter the membrane. Because again, this right here is made of fats. And so the lipid bilayer is essentially nonpolar. Okay, so we want nonpolar to be with the lipid bilayer. And let's draw this in a better way so you can show, right? So over here, I'm gonna have my polar groups. These are my phospholipid heads, right? And then over here, I'm gonna have my lipid tails. Testosterone, since it's a nonpolar molecule, it's actually a steroid, it can actually reside in the middle. It doesn't really want to, it has places to go, but if it had to, it, it could stay in the middle. It could be interacting with the phospholipid tails because of the, that, that is a nonpolar region. And so it can diffuse through the nonpolar region and go into the cell. So gases and steroid hormones, they can do that. So they would pass very easily, right? So here are the lipid tails right there. But what about small uncharged polar molecules like water? Well, water, it doesn't really want to interact with the nonpolar region, right? So water's uh, over here on the outside. Sometimes you'll have a water molecule that can slip inside, but it doesn't want to do that. So it almost never happens, but it does. And you also have ethanol and glycerol. So glycerol is pretty easy to remember because the glycerol is made of, or well, it makes the phospholipid tails. So pretty, pretty self-explanatory. It's already inside kind of. But if you just have free roaming glycerol in the environment, sometimes it can interact and diffuse through the membrane. And then we have ethanol. So ethanol is liquor or just alcohol. So whenever you're drinking about three bottles of vodka or tequila or whatever, um, sometimes the alcohol will go through the lipid bilayer and it can interact with the cell. And alcohol really is a toxin, it's a drug. It's one of the most widely used drugs in the country, uh, or I guess in the world. But ethanol can diffuse through the membrane but it doesn't really want to do that because again, it's a small polar molecule. It'll happen sometimes, but not a lot, okay? So, this is fun. I like talking about liquor. It's very cool. All right, then we have the larger uncharged polar molecules. So up until now, we've been talking about uncharged. This is about nonpolar. But for here, we have the larger uncharged polar molecules and these guys almost never, almost, they almost never enter the lipid bilayer. They have to use channels or transporters. And essentially what a transporter is, or a channel, it's kind of like this little tube that goes through the lipid bilayer and you have little molecules enter and they have like a shortcut. So glucose would use a transporter or a channel. But let's say that we don't have it. Let's just say we're just with the normal cell wall. So amino acids, glucose, and nucleosides. So nucleosides, they're kind of like well, for lack of better words, they're kind of like a ribose sugar. And they have, you know, some something on it. But then they have their serines or purines, right? So they have purines, pyrimidines, etc. And so let's just draw something out, right? I mean, I don't know how it looks like off the top of my head, but it's essentially like a ribose sugar and it has a purine or it has a pyrimidine. And it, it does not, does not, does not have a phosphate. But you can tell that this is already too large, right? This is already too large right there. You already have a cyclohexane with a ribose and you're expecting me, you're expecting me to be crossing this guy no, it's too much. A nucleoside, which is a, a derivative of a ribose sugar, it's not going to enter the cell. It's already too large and it's kind of polar, but it's not going to do it. Okay. Amino acids are essentially like the building blocks of proteins, and those are very large. You can have a whole strip of amino acids, and those are almost never going to enter the cell membrane. And then we have glucose, which is a common sugar.
and that's also pretty large, it's not going to do it. Sometimes it'll do it, but not really. Now we have ions. So ions are actually charged, they are charged, and they are polar. And so those never ever enter the cell membrane. They always have to have an ion transporter. If there is no ion transporter, it's not going to diffuse easily into the membrane. Why? Well, because this is a largely uh, nonpolar region, and you're expecting potassium or some other ion to enter a charged, um, you're expecting a charged molecule to enter an uncharged environment. That's not going to work. Potassium is not going to just diffuse into it. That's going to increase the amount of energy into the system, and that's bad. The environment doesn't want to increase the amount of uh, energy in the system. It wants to decrease the amount of energy, en energy into the system, right? So to recap, ions are never, ever going to enter the bilayer. They need an ion transporter. If you put a positively charged ion into the cell membrane, that's going to drive up the amount of energy in the system. That's very unstable. That's like giving caffeine to a baby. You don't do that. The baby's going to be crying and uh, breaking furniture and eating your food. You don't want that. You want to decrease the amount of en energy in the system, right? So we do that. So ions almost never, ever, they never, never cross the membrane. Okay? So, yeah. So within the lipid bilayer, we have some movement. And this movement really occurs going from left to right. So we can have a phosphate head. And like I said, this phosphate head can vibrate. And when it vibrates, it can go from the left or it can go to the right. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes when we vibrate, we can move. And so right here, we can have phosphate one, two, three, four, five, and six. But sometimes we can have the movement occur. So we can have two, one, five, four, six, three, right? So they can change positions, etc. So we can move around the lipid bilayer, we can travel, we can vibrate, it's cool, it's nice. But one thing that almost never happens without um, an enzyme, and we'll talk about that enzyme later, is that you will almost never have a lipid go into the other side. And so here we would have the external environment and here we would have the internal environment. So you would have your organelles and stuff right there, you know, like lysosomes. This is like inside the cell and this is outside of the cell. So you will almost never ever have a phospholipid go from the external environment cross into the internal environment because it costs too much energy to do that. So it won't happen spontaneously. You need an enzyme to do that, okay? So, yeah. So where does membrane creation occur? So we make membranes from the ER. So the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, makes membranes. Makes membranes. Right. And so biosynthetic enzymes, they're bound to the cytosolic monolayer. Okay, so they're bound to the cytosolic monolayer of the ER. And then they produce and they insert phospholipids. So right here, we're gonna be inserting some phospholipids. But there's a problem. If you keep inserting phospholipids into this bilayer, you're gonna have an uneven amount. So eventually it's gonna look like this. Right, so we have phospholipids over here. and then we have a little bit of phospholipids. And that's gonna be really uneven, it's not gonna be uh, structurally supportive. And we need to shift some of these phospholipids to this side. But remember that I told you that, hey, phospholipids are almost never gonna shift to that side? That's true. But I said that you need an enzyme to do that. So one of the enzymes that we can use is called a scramblase. And so scramblases, so let's write scramblases, they kind of eliminate this problem. They randomly pick some phospholipids and they scramble them into the inner layer right there. Okay, so they randomly transfer phospholipids from one monolayer to the other monolayer. And this does it uh, randomly. It doesn't really need energy to, to do this. So this does it spontaneously. Spontaneously. 
and it does some reactions and stuff. It's really complicated. You don't need to know how it does it. You just know that it does it. Okay, so you just need to know that scramblase. Uh, it allows us to make the membrane symmetrical. So this one is symmetrical. Symmetrical. Okay, so it grows the fossil membrane symmetrically, and it does that spontaneously without any energy added. So we use scramblases. So again, scramblases catalyze the transfer of random phospholipids from one monolayer to the other. And so now we have a symmetric growth of both halves of the bilayer. So we have an equal amount of phospholipids. So normally, the two halves of the bilayer, they have different sets of phospholipids. So notice that we have some reds and some browns. But what if some new material from the external environment tries to merge with the cell membrane? Well, again, we would have kind of like this uneven amount of material. And so we use a different enzyme, right? We use a different enzyme. Instead of the scramblase, we use the flipase. So the flipase enzyme, it will actually transfer, it will transfer the new material into the internal environment. So over here we can see, let's see, red, red, green, yellow. So we have over here and that. So this was kind of like the new material that entered, but we need to flip it. We need everything to go inside the internal environment. And so what happens here is that we are going to use flip base and we're going to flip these phospholipids over there. And when that happens, we have a new addition to the internal environment. Okay, so notice that we are kind of like in the original position right there. But notice that we just flipped the external phospholipids into the internal environment. So that was a very specific flip. It wasn't random and we're not scrambling. We're not making a symmetrical area. We're making an asymmetrical area. Okay, so this kind of like uh, it retains asymmetry. So this retains retains asymmetry. Okay, and it uses ATP, uses ATP. So again, to recap, we want everything to go inside this section. So when I first add it, the top part is facing the external environment, but I want that top part to face the internal environment. To do that, I have to flip the top part into the internal environment, this part right there. So I use the enzyme flipase, and flipase re retains, it keeps asymmetry, and it uses ATP because it's really specific, specific, specific selection, selection. So hopefully that clears off uh, flipase for you. What if you want to transfer something from the internal environment into the external environment? Before I get into it, I have to explain the difference between nine, non um, cytosolic phase and cytosolic phase. So, non cytosolic phase means that this phosphate, or I guess this lipid bilayer, is facing the external environment. So, let's say that this is water. Okay, so water is in the external environment. Cytosolic phase means that these phospho heads, these phos phospholipid heads, are facing the internal environment. So the gray color that you see is the cytoplasm. So this is the gray, this is cytoplasm, okay? So let's say that we need to transfer these proteins from the Golgi apparatus. Notice that this protein is facing the water inside the Golgi apparatus. So this protein is facing the water. And therefore, this protein is facing the what? It's facing the non-cytosolic face. Okay, so this is the non-cytosolic face. But if I begin to pinch this bulb, it becomes a sphere. And notice that this protein is still facing the non-cytosolic face because this is water. Okay, now if I merge this vesicle to the phospholipid bilayer, it will actually transfer this protein into the external environment. Now notice that this protein is still facing the non-cytosolic phase. It's still connected to the water. 
And so what does that mean? It means that cell membranes, when they're transferring cell compartments, for instance, let's say that we need to transfer insulin to the external environment, the cell membrane will retain, will retain its asymmetry. And you know what? I, I misspelled asymmetry in the last slide, but that's okay. I'm not really good at spelling. And so what I'm saying is, whenever you're transferring uh, insulin or proteins or whatever from the cell, you are always gonna have a retention of the asymmetry. The things are gonna be uneven. The amount of phospholipids are gonna be uneven, but that's okay. You want that to happen. So again, the proteins or whatever you're transferring, could be insulin, is always gonna be facing the non-cytosolic face and it will keep facing that side. So again, this protein is always in contact with water and when we release it into the external environment, it's gonna be in contact with water. So it will be facing the non-cytosolic face. And so, yeah, that's uh, pretty difficult to kind of comprehend, but you should be able to get it. You may be asked, where do glycolipids get their sugars? Because glycolipids, we have glyco, so that's a sugar, and then we have lipids. So first of all, they're going to be facing the, uh, they're going to be facing the um, non-cytosolic side. So this is the non-cytosolic, cytosolic side, which means that this is just the external environment, external. So there would be water, and they actually get their sugars from the Golgi apparatus. Okay, so they get their sugar groups from the uh, from the Golgi gained from Golgi. So that's that's really it. And if they ask you where did they get their sugar groups, was it in the non-cytosolic portion or in the cytosolic portion? They actually get it from the non-cytosolic portion. So this is the non-cytosolic portion. Okay, so yeah, that, that's really it. So again, glycolipids are going to be found on the external environment, also known as the non-cytosolic portion. Okay, because glycolipids, they can do a lot for you. So within the lipid bilayer, you're going to have membrane proteins. So right here we have membrane, membrane proteins. And the way I remembered the membrane proteins was through the mnemonic TER. So TER stands for transporters and channels, anchors, receptors, and enzymes. Enzymes are super important within cell signals. And sometimes if you have a mutation in one of the enzymes, you can develop cancer. And so when we begin talking about cancer later on in this course, uh, which is an amazing topic to discuss, so much medication that can be created for cancer. When we talk about cancer, we will be talking about cell signals. So those are very important. Uh, same thing for receptors. So receptors and enzymes, those typically go hand in hand. Now anchors and transporters and channels, those are also pretty important mainly transporters, transporters and channels, but anchors are mainly like support proteins. So they're kind of like in the background. So the main thing that we're going to be focusing on are transporters and channels, receptors, and then enzymes. Okay, so usually in that order. First, we're going to be talking about transporters and channels, then receptors, and then enzymes. But the mnemonic that you need to know to remember these guys is TER, which stands for transporters and channels, anchors, receptors, and enzymes. Now, the way that those membrane proteins associate with the lipid bilayer are about four ways. So those proteins can be transmembrane proteins, they can be monolayer associated uh, alpha helixes, which is really specific, they could be lipid linked, and they can be protein attached. Okay, so first for transmembrane proteins, these are pretty typical. For instance, you have the alpha helix, or you have the multiple alpha helixes. And then you also have the beta barrels. And these are called integral proteins. Integral just means internal. So you'll often find these proteins associated with the inside of the lipid bilayer. Usually you can form channels 
right? And so we can have ions. Previously, these ions could not enter the cell, uh, the cell bilayer, but with these little channels, with these transmembrane channels, they can enter and do whatever they need to do for the cell. Without these transmembrane channels, then you wouldn't be able to have ions enter. So they're very important. Uh, beta barrels, they are typically used for aquaporins and water can enter the cell. Normally water wouldn't want to enter the lipid bilayer, but with these beta barrels, they can enter the cell membrane. And of course you have the monolayer associated alpha helix. Um, it's not really that important in undergrad, so it's not really talked about, but these are integral proteins. Now you have the covalently attached lipid, we'll talk about that later. Um, specifically lipid link, those are really interesting. And then we have the protein attached. Now these guys are peripheral proteins, meaning that they're really found in the surface of the, um, the cell membrane and in the um, cytosolic portion. So we have the cytosolic portion, and this is the non-cyto. And so what I'm saying is that the, uh, these proteins, they use interactions, right? And they're really gonna be close to the cell membrane. And notice that they have like a transmembrane portion, uh, portion. Okay, so they have a transmembrane portion and they're attached to the cell membrane. So here is an alpha helix. And alpha helixes, they really form these transmembrane channels. And these channels are often 20 nonpolar amino acids long, right? So we have 20 nonpolar amino acids. So we have nonpolar amino acids. And so you need 20 nonpolar amino acids typically to make a channel, okay? And one question that is always asked on exams and MCATs and maybe lawyer exams, I don't know, but those questions they always ask, if you have a transmembrane domain, so a transmembrane domain, what kind of amino acid would you find? And you're like, okay, well, well, what do you mean? And they would say, you know, we have serine, we have threonine, now let's make something, uh, we have lysine, and then we have alanine. So out of those, those four answer choices, which amino acid would you be most likely to find? And the answer choice would be alanine. Why? When, we're, when they're talking about the transmembrane domain, they're talking about this portion. Okay, so this portion is nonpolar. And these amino acids are hydrophobic. So these amino acids right there are connecting, they're in contact with the nonpolar side of the phospholipid bilayer. And so I don't want to have a polar amino acid. Serine, threonine, lysine, those are polar amino acids. Really, you would find them inside the channel. They would be facing the water because water is entering over here. These external amino acids are gonna be facing the nonpolar environment. And so I'd rather have alanine, gl um, glycine, valine, isoleucine, uh, tryptophan, most likely, you want those to be in contact with the nonpolar region. Now, if they wanted a hydropolar, um, hydrophilic region, you would use polar molecules like serine or lysine, right? So that's always a good answer to have or a good question to, to know. Okay, so this is a transmembrane domain. This would be this guy, specifically the nonpolar region. Okay. So again, we have some hydrogen bonds, right? Those are pretty cool, I guess. Um, these hydrogen bonds are connecting these strands together. And that is what helps us create the structure, okay? So yeah, so alpha helices, they typically make these uh, transmembrane channels. They're pretty cool. So over here, we have a cluster of transmembrane alpha helices. And right here in the green portion, these would actually be the hydrophobic amino acids. So because over here we have the lipid uh, bilayer, and we know that lipid bilayers, they have fats, and fats are nonpolar. And so really, to be in contact with the nonpolar region, I would want to have my hydrophobic amino acids. So again, you would have your uh, alanines, your valines, 
right? And those would be in contact with the lipid bilayers. But inside where the water enters, so we have water, I'm able to enter the cell. I want to have my uh, hydrophilic amino acids. So in the red, I would rather have threonine, serine, lysine, um, you know, all those good things. Tyrosine, you know. So yeah, I'd rather have my polar amino acids in the center. If you're a scientist and you want to find the structure of a cell membrane, you would use a hydropathy plot. So we have a hydro hydropathy pathy plot. Okay, so what does that show? It shows how many nonpolar domains we have within a cell. Okay, so we have possible, so we have possible transmembrane, transmembrane domains. And remember that trans membrane domains, those are typically nonpolar. And so what they do is that they run the substance through a computer and they count how many nonpolar amino acids are within a region. So let's say over here we have this amino acid, right? And we detect one section, one section where there are more than 20 amino acids that are nonpolar. So here in the green, in the dark green, these are more, more than 20 amino acids that are nonpolar. And so you need a minimum of 20 amino acids to make a nonpolar region, right? So that would be a transmembrane domain. So within this molecule called glycophorin, there is at least one transmembrane domain. This is a transmembrane membrane domain, okay? So again, we have 50 to 100, right? So that could be like 75. So there's about 25 amino acids. Let's go over here, let's, because uh, the number between 15 and 100 is 75. So 50 to 75 is 25 amino acids. So there's about 25 amino acids that we know for sure are nonpolar. And if there is more than 20 amino acids that are nonpolar, most likely they say they transmembrane domain. Now, if we're talking about bacterial rhodopsin, which we know is an alpha helix transmembrane domain, we know that this is a membrane channel. Now, notice that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven sections. Since we have seven sections, I know that this for sure is a transmembrane channel because alpha helices, alpha helices right here, They like to span the membrane like seven times, okay? So let's write this. We span the membrane. We go one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? So typically, whenever you have an alpha helix, they like to cross the membrane like seven times, okay? Uh, specifically for GPCR receptors, right? So we're going to be talking about GPCR receptors later on in this uh, class, but just know that GPCR receptors, they cross the membrane seven times. So most likely, this is most likely a GPCR receptor, just looking at it right now, okay, because it has seven uh, crosses with the alpha helix. And so scientists, again, we use a hydropathy plot to find how many nonpolar amino acids are within a region. And depending on that, they can find out if this is a uh, transmembrane domain. Okay, so it's just a fancy way to find how many channels a cell membrane has. So here we have bacteria rhodopsin. So we have bacteria, bacteria rhodopsin. And it turns out that it is not a GPCR receptor. I was just looking at the plot and I just made a, a guess, but really it's not a GPCR receptor, okay? But notice that we do have seven, we have seven uh, alpha helices. Let's count them. This goes one, let's go uh, two right here. Uh, this is three for this guy. Let's go over here. We have uh, four, five, six, and seven.
So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So there are seven transmembrane alpha helices within bacterial rhodopsin. So that hydropathy plot was pretty accurate because it detected seven domains where they are nonpolar. Each alpha helix is about a domain. So there are seven domains that are nonpolar. And these domains just happened to create a transmembrane channel. So hydropathy plots allow us to uh, estimate or guess where a transmembrane channel is in a cell membrane. And if you want to know what a bacterial rhodopsin does, it's essentially a membrane protein within bacteria that pumps uh, hydrogen. So it receives uh, energy from the sun and it pumps out some hydrogens. Okay? So it pumps hydrogens out into the external environment. And that's actually how it makes ATP. So we're, we'll talk about that later too. It's pretty interesting. So let's talk about glycophorins for a moment. So many alpha helical transmembrane proteins have these glycophorins. Okay, so here is the transmembrane alpha helix. But outside of it, in the external environment, we're going to have this mess. It looks like spaghetti. Everything looks like spaghetti. right? But notice that we have these sulfur bonds. And these sulfur bonds are called disulfide sulfide bonds. And we call them disulfide because there are two sulfurs, which means di, and they're making a bond. And a bond means a bond. I know, very scientific. But really, these disulfide bonds come from a certain amino acid called cysteine. So cysteine, right? Uh, when they bond, they make cysteine bonds, okay? But really, they come from the amino acid cysteine. But notice that we also have sulfur bonds. Well, not sulfur bonds, but we also have sulfur inside the cell. So this is the cytosol. This is the internal environment. Now you're probably wondering why they're not making bonds with each other. Well, that's because they are reduced. So in this context, whenever you reduce something, it means that you add hydrogen. So reduced means add hydrogen. So if I take this sulfur bond and I add a hydrogen, I'm going to reduce it. And whenever I reduce a cysteine bond, I'm going to break it, and I just form a sulfahedral group. Okay. Oxidized, in this context, oxidized, and I can never spell. So oxidized just means that we remove we remove hydrogen. So if I remove this hydrogen and I remove this hydrogen, they could form a bond and they can make a disulfide bond. And therefore, since these sulfur groups are making a bond with each other, we can say that the external environment, you know, something that is outside of the cell, we can call that a oxidizing environment. So the external environment is an oxidizing environment. So I have an oxidizing environment. But the internal portion of the cell, the cytosolic phase, is going to be called a reducing environment. Okay, So the cytosol is a reducing environment, and the non-cytosolic portion is the oxidizing environment. You will get questions on that. so. For any biology class, that's always a popular topic to talk about. And so within these uh, glycophorins, you'll have certain uh, amino acids that are going to co covalently attach to these oligosaccharides. So these sugars are going to be attached to the amino acids within this protein via covalent bonds. There. And, and really, that's all you need to remember, that the sugars bind to the covalent uh, amino acids, right? And that the cytosol is a reducing environment and that the non-cytosolic portion is the oxidizing environment. So here we have this adorable looking thing and I always love writing the symbol. It's a beta barrel. That's not a very good beta, but let's write it again, right? 
always like reading it. So this is a beta barrel. Barrel, right? So, yeah. And what happens here is that the beta barrel is going to be forming like a pore. So it, f it forms a pore within the cell membrane and it allows water, allows water to enter the cell. So again, this would be the external environment and this would be the internal environment. And notice that since we form a pore, the water can enter. And so really beta barrels, they sometimes form aquaporins. Right. And again, this would be a transmembrane domain as well. And beta barrels are typically found within bacteria, the mitochondria, and also chloroplasts. And chloroplasts. Okay. So this is a aquaporin. And it allows the passage of small nutrients metabolites and also inorganic ions so ions can enter here you know nutrients let's say a taco can enter here uh, metabolites uh, like a vitamin those can enter through the aquaporin so now you have aquaporins and porins to um, facilitate the passage of ions and stuff so aquaporins is for water but then porins or for everything else, for like ions, vitamins, tacos, um, anything else really, yeah. If you're a scientist or a huge nerd, probably both, but if you're one of those people that like doing experiments, sometimes you need to denature the protein or you need to denature the cell membrane, right, to study the cell. And so if you want to denature the cell membrane, you would actually have to use a detergent. So detergents, And we have two detergents over here. So detergents are generally amphipathic mo molecules. So these guys are amphipathic. Right, so they're both polar and nonpolar. Right, so again, this would be the polar part and this would be the nonpolar part. Now, you have two types. You're gonna have the strong detergents and you're gonna have the mild detergents. So the strong detergents, for instance, sodium dodectyl sulfate, that is going to unfold the protein. Okay, so strong, strong detergents, uh, for instance, SDS, and you've probably seen SDS from SDS page, which uh, separates uh, proteins via their mass, not their size. Right. So strong dodecyl, sorry, so sodium dodecyl sulfate is a strong detergent and it's actually going to unfold. It's going to unfold proteins. Okay. And it dissolves membranes. But what about Trident X100? What is that? This is a mild detergent. And mild detergents for instance Trident that's gonna dissolve the protein or it, really it dissolves the membrane so it dissolves but it does not unfold the protein does not does not unfold and so if I were to do a page, right, and I wanted to separate by mass, I would use SDS page, right? So if I wanted to separate these proteins by mass, I would use SDS page. This is mass analysis. And if I wanted to separate the proteins, but I wanted to do it by size, not mass, I would use a mild detergent, for instance, Trident 100. So I would separate by size. This is always asked for laboratory exams, MCAT, uh, biology, whatever, they, they, they say this question, they're like, okay, protein X and protein Y need to be separated. If I want to separate them by mass, what would I use? Would I use SDS? Would I use Trident 100? Would I use this other detergent or this detergent, whatever? You would say, if I want to separate by mass, I need to go with a strong detergent, which is SDS page.
oh, I need to separate by size. So I need something that does not unfold the protein. Okay, so that would be the mild detergent. Okay, so back to talking about cell membranes. The plasma membrane is actually reinforced by some underlying uh, structures. So the plasma membrane, plasma membrane is reinforced, is supported by the cell cortex. Okay, so what is a cell cortex? So the cell cortex is what you see in the gray. So the gray is the cell cortex. It would be this little bad boy right here. Okay. Right here. So the cell cortex is kind of like a network of fibrous proteins. So these fibrous proteins are connecting the cell membrane. Okay. And these fibrous proteins are actually called spectrin. Right. So the spectrin forms this network. And this network supports the plasma membrane. Okay. And we are facing the cytosolic portion of the plasma membrane. Right. So to recap, the plasma membrane is supported, right? Because it's kind of like jelly. And we need to support this jelly with something. So we're going to tie some ropes around this jelly. This these ropes are called spectrum. And the spectrum is in the cytosolic portion. Cytosolic portion and they help so that the cell membrane doesn't leak out or doesn't have like a, a random shape it's always secured right so if you're gonna go to like a store and you bought something large you're not just gonna put it on the roof of your car and just drive off no because that is not secured it's gonna fall off it's gonna break down so you need to tie the cargo with some ropes and that helps it to retain its shape, helps it to be securely attached, and it doesn't break apart, and it doesn't burst or whatever, right? So we use spectrin, which are some proteins, and they're made of fiber, and, well, they're not made of fiber, they're fibers, and they actually support the cell membrane. So again, we have some attached proteins, we have some actin right here, some actin proteins, and they make up the spectrin. So the spectrin comes from this actin um, right there. And spectrin is going to attach to these little anchors, which are called attachment proteins. And those attachment proteins actually come from the uh, transmembrane proteins. So here's some transmembrane proteins. Sometimes they're going to have attachment proteins. And the spectrin is going to attach itself to the attachment protein. And it's going to offer support to the cell membrane. So within experiments, sometimes when cells are combined, the proteins from each cell, let's call this protein A, and let's call this protein B, the proteins from each cell will actually diffuse and go to different areas of the cell. So let's take that, we get a, a mouse cell, and let's get a human cell. So the mouse cell has protein A, human cell has protein B. If we make a hybrid, uh, a hybrid cell, protein A and protein B, at first, they're going to be in equilibrium. But later on, these proteins are going to be moving around. And so now we have an equal dispersion of protein A and protein B. So you can find random amounts of protein A and protein B around the surface. So this proves, this proves that proteins, or um, yeah, so proteins actually move. And they move on the cell membrane. Right, so they're just not attached into one area. No, they have the ability to shift around and to move. Okay. So sometimes if you want to restrict the movement of proteins, you have different ways to do it. So for instance, you can have proteins that are tethered, tethered to the cell cortex. And when it's tethered to the cell cortex, it can't move, obviously. Uh, you can also have it uh, tethered to the extracellular matrix. So we are attached to the matrix. Or you can have a uh, protein restriction on the surface of another cell. So we can have the restriction of proteins 
on the surface of another cell, right? So this is another cell. So to recap, if you want to restrict the movement of proteins, you can restrict it to the cell cortex. You can have a restriction in the cell matrix. Let's uh, do this better. So we can have a restriction in the cell matrix. Or you can just glue it on to another cell and these proteins can't even move, right? So what if we just wanted to focus on one cell? Well, if I wanted to focus on one cell, I can add these little barriers. And these are called diffusion barriers. And what happens is that this protein wants to hang out with its friends, so it tries to go, but when it hits this black portion, it stops. Okay, so now I can't go to my friends, I can't have uh, tequila, I can't have tacos, I can't party because this wall is blocking me. And so that is called a diffusion barrier, right? So that can be artificially added or it can be um, natural, right? So again, if I want to restrict the proteins, I can add them to the cell cortex, I can add them to the matrix that restricts it, I can glue them together to another cell, I can't move around or I could just add a diffusion barrier. If I wanted to measure the time that it takes for proteins to move around, I can actually do that using FRAPS. So FRAPS uh, stands for this. So FRAP stands for fluorescent recovery after photobleaching. Okay, so this is fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching, photo bleaching. So this is EA, bleaching, okay? So what I want to do is that I'm gonna get this uh, cell membrane with proteins. I'm gonna add some light to it. So I can put like a dye and that's gonna put some, uh, some fluorescence, fluorescence, right? And that shows a bright light that the scientists can see. And later on, that scientist is going to use a laser, and they're going to remove the light from the cell membrane. Eventually, the cell membrane is going to move these proteins, and these proteins are going to compensate. They're going to make up for the lost light. And eventually, we will have an equal amount of light. So if I add a laser over here, and I remove the light from this uh, region, eventually the surrounding proteins are going to move, and they're going to uh, refill the lost light. Okay, and we can measure the time that it takes. And if it takes a little bit of uh, time to do it, then we have a very fast protein. If it takes hours and hours to replace the lost light, then it's a very slow protein. And so now I'll show you a video of how this process occurs, and hopefully you'll understand it uh, so you won't be uh, confused on exams. The lateral mobility of membrane proteins can be measured in living cells by FRAP which stands for fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. For this purpose, membrane proteins are often expressed as fusion proteins with the green fluorescent protein GFP and observed with a fluorescence microscope. A selected area of the cell is then bleached with a strong computer-controlled beam of laser light. Those membrane proteins that are not anchored, and therefore can diffuse in the plane of the membrane, quickly exchange places with their neighbors and fill back in the bleached area. From the rate of this fluorescence recovery, the diffusion constant of the protein can be calculated. Here, GFP is fused to a membrane protein that lies in the membrane network of the endoplasmic reticulum. After bleaching, we observe quick recovery of the fluorescence, showing that the protein is very mobile in the plane of the membrane. The same experiment can be repeated using a protein that is firmly anchored and not free to diffuse. Here, we observe GFP fused to a protein of the inner nuclear membrane that binds tightly to the meshwork of the nuclear lamina. After photobleaching, no fluorescence recovery can be seen over the same time frame.
Hopefully that movie was enjoyable to watch. It's not really a movie. It hasn't won any Emmys. I have. I've won a Grammy, an Emmy, a Raspberry, everything. But hopefully you understand how Fraps works. So now we go back into the eukaryotic cell. So the eukaryotic cell, they have carbohydrates on the exterior side. So we have carbo carbohydrates on the exterior. And really, they form this carbohydrate layer. And scientists, they call this carbohydrate layer a glyco glycocalyx. So it's called a glycocalyx. And in this glycocalyx, you're going to have glycolipids on the plasma membrane, but you're going to have glycoproteins and proteoglycans. So these proteins, which are called uh, glycoproteins, and proteoglycans proteoglycans they do the same thing and that is they use these sugars to protect themselves or I guess to protect the cell and they also use the sugars as a recognition signal so for instance if I didn't have these sugars I would actually be killed like the cell would be killed right because it's a foreign substance. But since I have these sugars, the system recognizes the cell as friendly. So for instance, you have blood types. So blood type A, B, O, A, B. They are separated by the sugars on their membranes. So this one might have a different sugar. This one might have a different sugar. This might have um, no sugars. This might have both sugars, right? And so these sugars allow for recognition of the um, cell. Now, the difference between glycoproteins and proteoglycans is mainly size. That's really it. Glycoproteins are smaller than proteoglycans, and proteoglycans are big. So these guys are bigger, and they do, they do the same thing. They form the same function. Glycoproteins are just smaller. Proteoglycans are bigger, and that's really it for the uh, glycocalyx. And so here's an image that shows the application of the uh, carbohydrates in action. So here's our immune system. Here's a neutrophil. If you take immunology, um, you may have seen a neutrophil. And the neutrophil is going to enter the uh, cell. This is the internal cell, inner cell. And it's going to release some granules into the cell to combat uh, foreign substance, right? So like a, an infection or bacteria. Is going to go and it's going to kill it. So to do that, I have to enter the cell. And right here, the cell is expressing some sugars, right? And so these little forks on the cell, they're going to recognize the sugar on the neutrophil. These little forks are called lectins. And lectins, they act like hands, and they're going to hold on to the sugar. So they, they recognize the sugar, and they're going to allow the neutrophil to slip inside uh, the cell and to enter and to do its job. And so really, this is called cell recognition. This is called cell recognition. And that is facilitated by the sugars of the cell membrane. Okay, so all around we have little sugars. They're gonna bind with the fork, the lectin, and it's gonna allow passage for the neutrophil. So again, the sugars allow the cells to withstand mechanical damage and they can also bind to other cells and allow those cells entrance, right? So he's one of us, we should allow him entrance because he has the sugars. And so that is the, um, the lecture over cell membranes. Hopefully you understand how cell mem membranes work, uh, the vo vocabulary, how they're formed, flip base, scramblase, sugars, neutrophils, all that jazz, even fraps, you know? If you hear fraps and you don't think about frappes or frappuccinos, well, then I did my job. So hopefully you understand how cell membranes work. So thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope that you have a great day. You are amazing, and I hope that you do well in all your classes. Thank you so much, and I love you. Goodbye. That's a great heart.